will address that is revenues, finance, money. How are we going to plan our money? How are we going to get money? How are we going to manage without money? So we're going to be addressing various aspects post lockdown on, on the money aspect. Of it. The second, our strength, our assets, our leaders, our people. How are they going to behave? How should they behave? How should they be trained post lockdown? And lastly, the light at the end of the tunnel, you know, silver lining, always. In times of adversity, there's always an opportunity. So we're we going to be talking about opportunities out there in spite of the dire situation right now. So with that, I'm going to launch ourselves into the money part of our session. And I'm going to invite one of our esteemed panelists, Pala Banerjee, who is the group president of Pearl Global Industries. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to put the spot on Pala. Welcome, Pala. Thank you. Thank you, Shami. Uh, I think that's a great uh, introduction that you have done and what the situation is as on date and where we live. So let me uh, take a deeper dive uh, into a little bit of uh, the fundamentals of this industry. Like what is the chain constitutes? So we have consumer at one end, then we have the retailers, the agents or the Lazen office, which is sourcing for, uh, for these uh, retailers. And then we have the manufacturers. So this is the, you know, the size of our, or I would say like the gamut of our conversation today. So what we'll do, like, let me just show you some of the fundamental uh, fundamentals, what's happening uh, in the each of these areas. Let's start with the consumers first. So as we just heard from Shami, that most of us are at this point of time in a lockdown situation. So in the West, they call it shelter at home. And uh, in India and uh, Bangladesh and all these places, we call it as uh, lockdown. So this is definitely changing some of the behavior of all of us. So as the retailers are looking at the consumer, they are keeping a close watch, what kind of behavior change that they will be undergoing. And that would define the marketing strategy or their selling strategy or every other part of their financial strategies as well. So there are experts who are at this point of time working upon what are those potential changes or shifts that we'll be seeing in the consumer behavior. Two of these are definitely like, you know, would be directly impacting the way the stores and uh, or way the consumers will buy. That means how much they're going to spend because with this lockdown and isolation, we are very mindful about what we are consuming and how much we are consuming. A lot of us are realizing that, okay, we have a lot of excess at home and same, same thing is happening in the West as well. On the other hand, like how you are going to buy or how you're interacting in the, in the point of sales, what kind of hygiene, what kind of products, what kind of background this product is coming from, those also will become important for these consumers. So these are the two things which will definitely define uh, how the retailers are going to strategize themselves. Let's look into the books of these retailers, like how, or before even looking at the retailers, let's see why this consumer size is. For a developed country like US, like we have an understanding that how much they spend and what is it, the size of this apparel. So if you see, that's, a, that's the total pie size. They had spent about $13.4 million, $4 trillion uh, in 2019, out of which the apparel market was about 3.1%, which is about 500 some billion. Now we are all existing for that part segment of the market. Of, of course, not in the US, but all other markets. So from this, uh, is what going to uh, you know define all our actions, all our strategies across the chain. So what happens to these big retailers who are approximately about quarter of that size of that uh, market of 450 billion, let's say 100 plus billion is handled by only about top 10 retailers in markets like US. So if you look into their books, there are two things, the two big heads, which is driving most of their expenditures are these two. One is cost of goods, if you look at it across all these famous retailers, it's coming out to be averaging around 60%. And then all other expenditures that they incur to make these goods come to the point of sales and do the sales. So all activities like developing a product, designing that product, bringing that product, advertising, marketing, 
all gamut of activities, rent, you know, everything, depreciation of their assets, all these things is sitting in this particular uh, cost structure. Even the commission that the agents are getting or a liaison office is spending that money of four or five percent, that also sitting in this uh, things. So keeping that in mind, what are the strategies that these retailers would be looking at as they are uh, going to this COVID situation? Let's take an example of a retailer, which is about a size of $12 billion. And that means the sale must be about, uh, about a billion dollar every month. Now, as COVID hit from 10th of March onwards, this retailer started closing down their shops. And why is that so? Because the consumers are not walking into the store anymore. The psychology, the sentiment of the market is very different at this point of time. With that, there's an immediate loss of revenue due to the store closures. Now these retailers are looking at about one and a half quarters of their earning as being washed out. From a $12 billion uh, company, they are looking at becoming an $8 billion company immediately. And that means a huge reduction or the you know, middle of the year, they have to rebudget everything. How do they re reorg everything to get to this $8 billion kind of sales? Because you cannot operate a company of two, uh, you know, $8 billion with your planning of $12 billion. So the next one, if you look at this COGS, so the goods uh, uh, that they have purchased, the kind of money that they block in uh, you know, getting these goods. So there, they have to immediately cancel the orders. The immediate actions that we saw, reaction that we saw from them is cancellations. They stopped the payment. They started negotiating discounts. And now after a month, they are realizing that it is not 2008 anymore when this kind of situation happened for last time. There are a lot of developments in uh, the NGO activities, the social, uh, uh, you know, the social sector, when countries like Bangladesh, where there were, uh, you know, fires, there were building collapse. So a lot of work has happened. So now those agencies are definitely pushing back and pressurizing back to empathize uh, with, the, uh, with the workforce in these countries for, to these uh, retailers. As a result, most of these retailers, are, we are seeing now coming back, re establishing some of those orders which they are cancelled earlier. So things are not as bad, but it's not normal as well. Uh, the long term kind of you know, strategy that we will be looking at is they will be very, very agile in terms of reducing their inventory. They won't keep that you know, lot of money blocked in that inventory. There would be a lot of strategy they would be forming in terms of how to bring the goods, replenishment, quick replenishment, the speed. Uh, there would be vendor managed inventory. There would be a lot of testing on, on uh, you know, e-platform or on physical platforms before they put those goods into the store. So that's the kind of strategy that we will see from these retailers from the cost of goods point of view. From their sales and gen general expenses or expenditures that they have, they are already shutting. The immediate reaction was to shut the stores, follow all the employees so that the cost, they don't continue to bleed as the revenues are not coming anymore. They had to stop all inventory coming into the their respective countries because they don't have the space to store so much of inventory anymore because there's no outflow of inventory. Only e-platform is working. That normally for a retailer is about 15 to 20%. Now that particular thing is way below than the kind of budgeting that they do. So they can't, now they're realizing they can't pay the bills. There is no rental bills that they're going to pay. Uh, there would be all around job losses. So they have started from furlough. Now they're talking about retrenchment. Outside the country, they're going ahead with retrenchments. There will be much leaner organization going forward. And there will be a lot of functions which they are looking into whether they're needed or not. For example, before the COVID, definitely none of them, all of, uh, I would say 56% of them that we saw were not doing so well. So they were looking at those departments which may not be the very crucial ones for them. So like exam example, like how much they should spend on designing versus curating, what kind of vendor base they should have so that a lot of the service levels can be done by the vendor themselves and they don't have to monitor. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that will continue to be on their radar. In terms of the profit or the at a corporate level, there's a fight between survival or they would go for a restructure, financial restructure. What are those options of low cost innovation? We are hearing that certain grocery stores like they for as they saw the jump in their uh, e-com, so they are not using any different new uh, fulfillment centers. So they are using their stores in the night to pack goods to be sent to these consumers. So that's like very low cost, quick thinking solutions. So those kind of uh, innovations we'll see more and more. There will be a lot of collaboration, like uh, Australian market people are talking to the UK market because the countries are different. 
maybe like there could be an opportunity of the inventory, which is so much of extra inventory that a country in the Northern Hemisphere have can be taken by the Southern Hemisphere because the seasons are opposite. So let's see like what, what kind of innovating thinking most of these retailers would be going through. Uh, there will be a lot of consolidation and mergers. Now, if I keep all these strategies that the retailers would have, how a manufacturer or an exporter would plan their budget or their costs, what are those cost components which drives the strategies at a manufacturer's end? You see, the raw material is almost about, what, 55% of, of the total cost? So for them, what kind of strategy would work? So they have to really focus on how to create or co-create sustainable solutions with their suppliers. Like as a manufacturer, I would be looking at some of our fabric suppliers and how we can work together. They can partner, how we can partner with giving them more information so that they don't have a marketing cost and I don't have a marketing cost. That's like doubling the effort. Can I reduce it? Can I take that advantage? Same thing goes for the trims and packaging. For things like, you know, the actual production, the cut make, what kind of activities that we should do so that we can get those advantages. What we need a very agile workforce it has to be much more productive now. There will be solutions of going automation, having modular lines. We have to change and the change has to be for upgradation. Now, these are what the two things that comes out is definitely the efficiency of first time and there will be a lot of new health standards and, and compliance standards which will be there in the factory. Immediately need to plan for that. So yes, cost is going to go up and a lot of changes is needed out here. For the banking purpose, the factoring charges are going to go high because now the insurers are going to be very, very wary of these retailers, what's happening in their books. Normally in the industry, people don't keep money for insurance. Like, you know, only like maybe like for the merchant payable, the factories or the vendors keep some kind of insurance. But what about works in, work in progress? With so much of cancellation that you have gone through, is there a possibility of an insurance? Uh, January, there was a very interesting event that happened. Two of the biggest insurers of the world, EULA and Tower Willis, they combined. So I don't know whether they had a foresight of what was going to happen. Uh, as a general, like if you look at the SGNA portion of the factories or the vendors, again, there would be huge shift. Those shifts will be in terms of being much more strategic focus rather than an opportunistic way of working. What are those better service levels that they have to provide to the customer? Now, service, talking of service levels, you know, the uh, term not often used by some of these buying agents and agent, uh, you know, Balazan offices is DIFOT, which means deliver in full and on time. Now, India doesn't have a very good reputation uh, historically on this. In my life of sourcing, I never saw India going beyond 88%. Compared with a Vietnam or a China, it never came down below 97%. So that's the kind of gap that we have to immediately fulfill to move and take a bigger share of the market. And uh, in terms of the uh, strategy that we saw in the retailers end where they may not spend so much of money in designing. So that means as a vendor, we have to step up with our design in, uh, you know, influence or like the work that we can do so that we can co-create for a retailer, a designer could be there in the company for maybe last two years or one year. And they are forming those tech pack sheets and design, uh, you know, concepts and giving it to the vendor. Where that vendor might be working with the retailer for maybe one decade, two decades, three decades. A lot of Indian vendors, like you know, Ambatu Clothing and Shahis and Pearls of the World. So they have been working with the vendor for their customers for a very, very long time. So who knows the retailer or or the customer of the retailer better? Those two-year-old employee or a vendor? So this is the this is the place where we can definitely do a lot if we can start co-creating as, as vendors. So these are some of the initial uh, thoughts of the fundamentals, what we can uh, take a deeper dive as we discuss more. I would say, or I would conclude that this bigger challenge that we are seeing today is also giving us a big opportunity. With that, uh, let me hand over back to Shami. Thank you, Palab, that, that was great. So basically, Palab, with his vast experience with the customers, with the, the clients, with uh, buying agencies. He has also indicated that, you know, we would have to play a much larger role in terms of design okay. innovation, having people on our own roles and take things forward. So to explain the situation, 
uh, let me uh, bring in the results of our uh, survey, uh, which uh, which talked about what is the impact of what is the impact of uh, the COVID-19 on the Indian apparel industry. And our survey revealed that orders worth of, if you look at the industry level, orders worth almost $3 billion are at stake. These are involving order cancellations and orders put on hold. This survey was participated by 77 manufacturers from different clusters of, uh, of, of India, and there were 60 uh, usable responses. At a firm level, average uh, manufacturing company lost about $1.49 million worth of, worth of goods, either in terms of uh, cancellations and, and shipments put on hold. We have sizable amount, almost 40, 40, uh, 45% orders where the payments are delayed, and there are 19% orders where the buyers have refused to pay the payments. As far as the, uh, the payment for the raw material is also concerned, almost in 43% cases, the suppliers did not receive money for their raw material. The results of this survey are also widely publicized by uh, media partners, the Economic Times, Times of India, and the international journals as well. And you'll be able to see them in details. But what we have concluded that at a, at a national level, almost one quarter worth of sales turnover is at stake, and that is huge. And that's going to have a big impact. As Pallav said, retailers will have big impact. There'll be a bigger impact at the, at the manufacturing end as well. What does that mean? Is this all doom and gloom, or can we? Or is is there a part? So in in this background, I would like to talk about the opportunities which exist for which exist for us, and uh, the immediate opportunities across the value chain is at least 15 to 20 percent productivity improvement available. Waiting, we just need to act on it. The second good news, the second opportunity is that the right first time quality level at every process from design to dispatch can improve. And that can give a lot of money. What Pallav was saying that we will need to invest into business. And the third thing, which is also equally important that we have opportunities for reducing the lead time. And should we reduce the lead time? That can open up a lot of marketing opportunities. So how do we capture these opportunities? What do we need to do is what we can look at. And here I would bring in a story of Ramayana, when the Vanar Sena reached South India and Southern tip of India, and somebody had to go to Lanka to find Sita, nobody could take that challenge. And that is the time Jamwant had to remind Hanuman of his powers, that, oh, Hanuman, you have the tremendous power. And that's where Hanuman acquired his powers, invoked the powers, and took a leap to Lanka. And the rest of the story is known to all of us. Why I brought this story here is, all of us as human beings have got tremendous amount of capabilities and powers. And it is a time, this pandemic is a time to invoke those powers and rise to occasion. And should we do so? Impossible is possible. Nobody can stop us. So this is the time to act. Now moving further with specific examples, and this is from my book, what I say is that every organization in the textile and apparel supply chain has got their money, money bank or their bank account, or their locker as a whole, and how money, hard-earned money is going down the drain. The rework rates in various processes are not fully known. And what does it make to our profitability is also not known. Many problems happened at design stage, which we have to actually sort of you know, suffer at the, at the manufacturing stage. So we really need to work upon it. Now the question is, can this be changed at a short time? Or is it a, does it require a long-term strategy? And here is a case, from a, from a women's wear factory from the NCR region, North India. And you see, through a quality improvement program, which is implemented over a period of about three months time, the rejection rate, cut to shift rejection went down from 4% to less than 2%. What does it mean to profitability? This means your profitability can go up by minimum 20% if you're assuming 10% profitability. If you're assuming 8% profitability, the profitability can go up by 25%. So here is the money which can be used for improving competitiveness. Let's move further. What does it mean to management? So what we need to do as owners, as the management, that we need to embrace lean principles. What does that mean? Lean in simple words is knowing what is waste, having courage to call it waste, and then make relentless efforts to eliminate waste from our value chain. And should we do that? Unimaginable opportunities can come out. 
what is also important to know many times people feel that lean is only about manufacturing no it is applicable from design to retail in every organization lean principles can be applied so let us look at examples sort of along with the concepts let us look at the evidence does it work and here is a case from bangladeshi factory one of our client factories and this is the result of a kaizen blitz event for two weeks in a pilot line and what it shows that concerted efforts involving everybody in short time can deliver excellent results here we've got almost 32% improvement in productivity we have reduction in the defect rate and what is more important we have almost 75% reduction in the wip and that's what pallab was talking about quick response modular manufacturing and bringing down the inventory here here is an example so in short time you can get results as long as you work towards it and lead from front Let's look at some more example. Does it work in smaller factories? Does it work in factories that produce fashion garments? So here is another case from Northern India, and this project was done for one of the UK buyers for their supplier factory. And you see, again in short time, we have productivity improvement. We have increase in workers' earnings as well as a result of productivity gain sharing, and swing throughput time reduced by almost 50% as a result of modular manufacturing. and modular manufacturing is not so much about technology it's about mindset how do we organize our people to respond quickly let's move further and the question may come to your mind that this may happen sporadically in one factory or other can this be replicated at a national level can it be replicated at large number of companies and here is a project we did uh, supported by uk and five uh, retailers from uk implemented in 66 factories in india and bangladesh this is the results of efficiency improvement 26% in india and 18% in bangladesh quality tremendous amount of improvement came in here and this is what paid back for the project handsome returns came in from here then we had worker migration going down 25% 50% worker absenteeism going down and more importantly worker earnings also improved the lesson here is that collaborative project where the buyer buying agent factory work together can deliver very very good results as long as the win win design and i hope that this example is what i shared it it gives a clear evidence of the kind of pots of golds that were sitting on in our organization and what it requires is a concerted effort to work together to capture this gold and convert that into competitiveness for our organization so i am quite positive that there is a fair amount of hope for us thank you and i'll pass it on to shami Can you? Hope you can hear me. Um, so, so we have to go and look for solutions. These solutions. It's just a question of where are we going to focus now? I think just to look at social media. Dr. Beda and Pallav talking about what the Indian industry could do to survive in this crisis. I own a small company, which is an SM uh, medium scale company. We do about 200 crores of business. And uh, when when I talk, uh, the biggest problem right now for all of us of my size is how, how are we paying our April salaries? this is this is the top of the mind agenda of all our exporter friends and uh, people that are we how or how we can pay the april salaries so this is where we start from a lot of other issues which face our industry as of now is the working capital issues we have uncertainty that our buyers and we don't know how strong our buyers are how will they survive this uh, this pandemic and how uh, and the lot of uncertainties of lockdown we are already seeing these days when will we open up how will the uh, government help us or not help us in this time in this testing times so these are the issues which all our uh, exporters all small and medium scale uh, manufacturers are facing as of now this is the gloom side 
but again i would say every gloom has the positive sides also so with the positive sides we see that when once we started the lockdown a lot of cancellations were happening not anymore buyers are talking to their uh, manufacturer friends uh, buyers are speaking to them reducing cancellations buyers are uh, seeing how they can help the manufacturers out and also that buyers i've i've had a friend who's saying that buyers are also paying for the goods which have been manufactured and still lying in the factory because we've not been able to ship these are some of the positive side and the biggest positive side what we are talking about right now is there is chances i would uh, i would uh, emphasize on chances that a lot of chinese business could shift to india in long term if we are able to provide the consistency the quality and the on time deliveries required by most of the customers this has been the biggest drawback for indian industry where we have lacked in all these three departments so uh, i uh, i would take a uh, cues from dr bheda's presentation where where we have uh, seen that indian factories miss out on few basic basic tenets of manufacturing we we are very bad in efficiencies efficiencies needs to be improved immediately in the factories if we have to survive this pandemic the efficiency part can be it's not big investment we can we can have small attachments to make the garments we can have uh, some profiling machine lot of automation has already happened in the southeast asian countries with the uh, profiling machines with placket making machine basic things so we can we can add to the efficiencies here and see that our costs don't rise so uh, that, that is one part of it right first time approach the quality problem this is the biggest thing which india lacks all the time we we have this right first time attitude is simply not visible in india we need to get that we need to come out with solutions we have to get on with our workforce to ensure that right first time happens this is the cost of quality which is never calculated by indian manufacturers the third last last thing is lean system of manufacturing i have implemented lean system of manufacturing in the factory for the last 10 years and been extremely successful with the kind of products we are doing we majorly do sportswear products and we are absolutely sure that with lean manufacturing i think the, this, this kind of a product is a great bet and our friends should focus on these uh, things so uh, i we have created also created a template where uh, for a short term what an exporter or needs to do uh, i will just put that screen on so uh, this is a very basic screen and uh, i have not uh, uh, like made it too scientific for anybody to understand or not understand it is a basic screen we are assuming that the orders in each factory will reduce by at least 30 to 35% so uh, having said that there will be other issues after lockdown as in social distancing i'm running the factory right now but we can only run the factory maximum by uh, 40 to 50% with our current uh, with us uh, with uh, with the existing uh, space we have because we have to follow the norms of social distancing so i've just created a, a format which uh, which will just keep us afloat in these times when we need to be ready and stay alive to get the opportunities which may arise once the covid situation is gone if we die in this period i don't think we'll have an opportunity after that so the the point here is that we need to survive this 3 to 6 months and basic things what we are talking about i have highlighted in red that a we have to reduce our management staff by at least 35% and by reducing the staff we uh, we are also reducing the salaries by about 16% so one part is reduce to survive in this period where the orders are low we need to adjust to our management staff and team whether it is retrenchment whether it is uh, furloughs whether it is uh, uh requesting them for a uh, for a pay cut it is depend from company to company i think they will have to decide and take action according to the company 
second i am not changing the rate of the worker because workers may not be available will be available is a big question mark which only after lockdown we will be able to understand and the last uh, second point what say consumable since we are now following social distancing we are following uh, uh, la, la, a more government initiative where we have to give workers workers some food in the factory or those kind of things we need to focus on electricity and consumables and reduce it by at least 33% other thing is the rental part we'll have to all negotiate with wherever we are working from to reduce the rents i think these three cost cutting measures and one final part is that the productivity has to be improved i have not given a very uh, big number here if we, even if we reduce the productivity by 15% i think we can save about 11% on our cmt this will help us survive these traumatic times and in my next section i will also be talking about opportunities to so that once we are surviving these times we can avail of those opportunities but if we don't survive these times i god save us actually back to you shami unmute me yeah can you hear me i am I think there was a lot of uh, breakage which was happening. So maybe while I'm speaking, maybe you can see what is wrong with your connection, right? Okay. So I think uh, um, I'm assuming that I'm going to talk about uh, you know what we can do in terms of people uh, retention, training. Uh, you know what's the way forward with the human resource because that's uh, and also the relationships because these are going to be very key factors uh, going forward. uh so one of the key things which we are finding out is that there has to be a very very deep shift in our uh, thought process and the way we act which means we have to let go of most of the bad habits which we've been carrying for a very very long time i think especially you know in india i think we are very uh, by by nature we tend to uh, you know uh, ignore a uh, lot of the things which are obvious to us we tend to be not so proactive when we need to be so those all things have to change and more importantly i think we have to realize that this covid way is a new way of living and uh, working and a lot of the um, you know the organization as a whole has to have majority of the workforce which sees itself like covid warriors we have to become conscious about the world which we are in we all have to uh, you know elevate our level we all have to do extra bit uh, you know and and we really really have to ensure that we are putting our 110% and then within the covid warriors i think we have to define a very different level of covid leadership and that covid leadership has to come uh, from the people uh, from the point of view of empathy at the same time efficiency being pushed new ways of training being pushed and so on the other thing which i want to emphasize is that i think we have to have a even higher level of focus the focus has to become heightened i don't think 80 20 rule will work anymore we have to move to 90 10 we have to discover first what are the 10% most essential things which we need to do what are my 10 best customers you know which are my 10 best suppliers which are the relationships i really really need to nurture and we really have to focus on that we have to ensure that we are uh, going deeper into uh, making sure that those relationships are getting even more cemented and uh, people are people can depend on each other you know in terms of what needs to be done and how it has to be done the last thing which i would like to say is that i think this is the best time to uh, really invest a lot on training optimization of the uh, roshan already illustrated dr bheda also talked spoke about that how these are low, very very low hanging fruits where we just have to tweak a little bit in terms of our thinking our thought process and we can gain tremendously when it comes to productivity and optimization of resources so uh, uh, shami yeah let me add to that uh, devi couple yeah. of points 
Uh, it's a very interesting time. Definitely, uh, talent management uh, will be very, very important. Uh, so, as we see these kind of changes, and if we have to poise uh, our India as a manufacturing country, so we have to really look into what kind of investment that you're going to do in our talents. Uh, I know it's, it's not a time that where most of these organizations have a lot of money to spend, but we have seen certain things which are very low cost, uh, which are almost like nothing is just like a mind shift, which uh, Devinder is talking about. Uh, one of the experiences that I had is, is one of the programs that we had started uh, at GAP is called PACE, uh, which is personal advancement and career enhancement. And for all the women folks, which works in the factory, uh, so we used to bring 20 or 30 of them together in a room and spend almost 80 hours giving them certain kind of uh, soft skills, like how to manage their anger, how to manage their time management, because they have some kind of social problems at home. Either they are like fighting a lot of, spending a lot of time accumulating water, uh, dealing with their in-laws, or maybe like some conflict with their husbands and families. So how do they deal with it? So as this workforce, like if we treat these uh, workers not as a commodity, but as an asset of ours and spend time or spend, give them those soft skills, they can be much more agile. And if we are going towards, uh, you know, uh, automation or we are talking about modular systems or we're talking about higher productivity, how good we are engaging with this workforce, that would become very, very important. So yes, uh, this mind shift is very important, David, as you were saying. And uh, if I talk about the executives or uh, the staff that the manufacturing uh, organizations would have, there also we'll see a lot of shift. As I was talking about that whole need from the retailers to co-create along with the vendors. So how does the vendor step up for this co-creation? So understanding the filters through which the brand is looking at, maybe like certain kind of tools like the 3D tools that we have today, which people have been toying with or using it a little bit, will become suddenly very common name. Like, you know, uh, I'm sure like names of Optitex, Browseware, Tukatek will be very, you know, household names in our industry going forward because everybody has to work on that. There will be not so much of contact between uh, the buying teams and uh, the vendors teams. So a lot of things will be happening digitally. So that means that this particular workforce also has to be very agile. They have to upskill themselves always continuously looking for new things. So there are a lot of uh, free softwares or free learning programs are there and various kinds of nets. And as this 60 or 70 days of people are sitting at their home and uh, going through a lot of these webinars and other things, it's all accumulation of knowledge. So I think that will become a culture that we, we have to all towards uh, work towards. And yes, the biggest thing is the mind shift, uh, which Devinder is talking about. So, so Pallav, <laughs> if, if I was to pick you up from both of you, Devinder and Pallav, uh, interesting concepts have come up and, and, and Roshan has also brought out the point about how the improvements can come in and the challenges around around quality and productivity and so on. So I would like to just reflect a bit on the fact that if you look at last, uh, say, uh, five, six years, so we have seen that many companies have made tremendous amount of progress on many of these issues as such. But unfortunately, these uh, good practices or these good examples are not publicized. So you know, we, we tend to hear more of negative things than the success stories. And in the previous years, we have done a lot of uh, sort of publication of good practices within India and outside the, outside the uh, other countries as well. And we need to send the positive stories so that more and more people get inspired and they get clear evidence that this is possible and we can, we can overcome these things. So let me share. Sorry, with, uh, sorry. Uh, like as yeah. you're saying, as yes. we talk about, so there is yeah. this, he has got this ATDC, which Dr. Koshi was heading. So yeah. They are training all these people on the PACE program as they're graduating from there. So Absolutely. definitely as a country, like we have this battery of uh, women or workforce just coming out who have this soft skill. So how as a manufacturer, we recognize and take them and nurture them. So that will be playing an important role. Sorry. Wonderful, okay. wonderful, Pallav. So let me share with you uh, a, a, a recent case and that would, that would give uh, sort of put things in perspective. And uh, so this is about, this is, uh, so what, what we're saying is that, and one of the participants said that you know, you've given the examples which are old uh, cases, what about the current cases? And uh, what I'm sharing with you is, is a company that we concluded a program just last week. So what should the companies be doing right now? Is really preparing the organization for the future. That is what we should be doing and what these companies have been doing in the last one month. What is also important is the 
emotional resilience of the top management leader. What kind of a vision are we able to share with our workforce? How do we show them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and really lead from front, saying that, yes, we will come together and together we'll come out victorious. And just to give two quick examples, this is one company which produces niche products. They do riding bridges with, with specialized fabrics and so on. And we have been talking about management programs for some time, but people have been busy and they could not find time. But the moment the lockdown happened, they got in touch saying that, Dr. Veda, can we have management programs? So we had a management strategy workshop with them. Everybody came on board and said, wow, we have to go forward. Followed by that, we had, we had about 10 days of training program for the mid-management, whereas almost 110 people joined from there, even from their villages using smartphones. So these new technologies are working and people really enjoyed that training, really found that they, they learned something and they could not believe that they could do it. What is more important is they came out with the action plan, which they started already implementing in terms of formulation of SOPs and stuff like that. And they see that as a, as a sea change in their understanding of what is possible. So from that point of view, and, and soft skills is also an important part in that. So mid-management training is very, very important. So if you talk about lean management, many a times people get mesmerized by the technology, but the biggest pillar of lean management is respect for people. What again, Pallav talked about, about the, the PACE program and so on. So how do we leverage the creativity of people? How do we really respect people to really be part of the organization as partners and take, take, the, take the performance forward is important. So uh, what is also important in this small visual I've shown is our multi-million dollar aircraft is as good as the pilot that flies it. In fact, when American Navy was looking at quality improvement program and they called Dr. Deming, and they were asking him what to do about technology improvement. He said, first focus on your people, improve your services to your people, improve their, their uh, what do you say, the morale, and, and you'll be able to win the biggest battle. So from that point of view, another example is a company from Tirpur. Last 15 days, they have been again training the entire organization. This morning, I reviewed their action plan, beautiful. So each department has come out with what are the areas in waste and how they will improve that. So that is happening, the leaders, are really right now using this opportunity for really sharpening their axe so that when, when they get into action, they will, be ha they will be a different company altogether. So this also brings in, a, brings in a question, and you have talked about Pallav, and then Devi also talked about, about the modular manufacturing or, or quick response manufacturing. So the question comes in, what about skilling? Is skilling cost effective? Is the investment in training cost effective? And let me share two case studies. And one is about uh, from, from uh, a, a manufacturing company in Bangalore. And if you see the training time in shirt and trouser manufacturing almost came down by 68% and 79% each. And this was one of the, uh, what is it, best practice firm. If that can happen to them, as long as we implement best practice uh, technologies and techniques, then training can become cost effective. The other uh, slide on the right hand side is a project which is ongoing in Bangladesh. Uh, this is data is based on almost 110 factories, project supported by a UK government called Shudokho. And based on these 110 factories, we have a data of 9,600 existing workers. Let me say existing workers who were upskilled. And in a couple of days time, I mean in a week's time, their output improved by almost 32%. So again, what I'm saying is that there's so much amount of improvement potential as long as we have resolve, as long as we use scientific techniques and then we focus on people equipping our trainers, there's so much amount of improvement potential. Devinder also talked about, and you also talked about the digitalization. And next big opportunity for training is digitizing our product development process. So if we are able to train our pattern makers, our, our product development teams on digital tools during the lockdown, we will be able to continue our product development without any problems. And maybe in future, your pattern makers can even work from home. They don't have to come to factory. So these are the kind of opportunities we must look at. There are tools of on a people like uh, companies like Chukatek, which are available, and they are made it available to people that they can learn from home and start digitalizing the product development process as such. So I would say that, yes, the leaders are really acting on it right now and they're sharpening, their, sharpening the tools so that they can come back 
in a in a new avatar to be able to capture the capture the uh, the the opportunities with that i will hand it over to you shami thank you uh, i hope I, i really apologize for the audio and uh, i've cut uh, the video for a short while and it relates to you if, if you feel that this is something you could do you know we are we're going to be sharing an email address at the end of the session you can always question uh, come back and uh, you know shoot us some questions and we'll be more than happy to uh, address them so this brings us to the end of the the people part of our uh, program and i would like to take us to the, the you know the wonderful part the opportunities like in every adversary adver there is opportunity out there and i'd like to bring in uh, roshan once again uh, to to talk about he's always been an opportunity seeker right from the time he opened those in his factory he's been finding opportunities and nailing it and i'd like to hear um you know roshan on what his thoughts are on finding opportunities during the situation thank you sami uh, we missed you for a long part uh, i thank you for introducing me so uh, i would just start with the story how i started this business after passing out of nif but when i started this business uh, it was a quota regime there and i could not export anything i it was a real difficult times for a new startup in those those times but then i uh, i started making sportswear which was unheard of in india at that point in 2001 and uh, realized that uh, i thought i started thinking that it is a niche kind of a market but uh, later realized that uh, man made fiber is more than 55% of the world exports and india is nowhere there so now i'll just share the uh, some uh, some things i have collated on opportunities so this i think uh, we missed out on one slide man made fibers this is the thing i've been working on for the last almost 20 years india is the second largest world producer of polyester and viscose but it is still sixth ranked in exports of man made fiber uh, it 2 uh, and 6 doesn't sound too diff, uh, too far away but when you see the numbers between the second largest uh, when the first largest and what we are doing it is minuscule we are hardly doing anything in this space which offers a huge amount of opportunity worldwide this is a uh, this is the sportswear market which is like in in fy19 man made ex, uh, fiber exports were about usd 9.5 billion of which only 40% is garments of the total textile and apparel exports of usd 37 billion china has a man made fiber export of usd 150 billion so if you look at the numbers i think uh, it's crazy and uh, honestly in the last 20 years since i have been doing this business i have not seen any concerted effort by any other company to look into this area and see if india can compete with the world in this category this is a more stable category uh, if you if you hear the talks and if you heard saying the first companies to revive after the covid uh, goes away will be the sportswear companies like nike is and adidas is of the world so uh, a fitness is becoming a culture and man made fiber we already have the base of man made fiber in india it is it will be a great time if we as an industry we invest more in this category and i'm sure uh, once the uh, covid pandemic is uh, go uh, going away or we will be in a much better space if we can crack this this portion of our business and uh, so this is one part of the opportunity which i feel india has neglected all this while and india has never availed of this opportunity uh, in the last 20 years whereas uh, whatever uh, china was doing it or taiwan was doing it earlier china took it over from them then uh, vietnam and cambodia are doing a major part of this business so this is uh, one part of the opportunity which i certainly feel that india should capitalize on and we should take it up in more uh, more aggressive way 
so this is part one of my opportunity second is medical textiles uh, like what happened when i was starting again uh, when i was starting in 2001 and realized that i didn't have business and i went into uh, sportswear again the same situation came a month back all factories closed all buyers not taking deliveries i realized how do we how do we pay salaries how do we run our businesses i uh, we started doing medical textiles medical textiles is one vast opportunity for anybody all of us if we can capitalize on here and uh, the ppe coverall medical mask is become a huge category after this covid 19 uh, 19 which is uh, which is like taking its toll over the world uh, economy so ppe coveralls manufacturing is an allied part of our garment manufacturing techniques and a lot of this comes from china with with covid 19 and with china's reputation right now a lot of this uh, a lot of the buyers are wanting to source these kind of kits from india but we don't have any infrastructure we don't have the right heat sealing machines we don't have the right uh, production techniques to make these kind of products this is the time if we can invest if we can research if we can organize ourselves and look at this this part of the business i think again a huge opportunity is waiting for us i was just speaking to my fellow uh, uh, panelist here devinder and he was talking about billions of pieces of requirements for pp and coveralls across the world which india does not even uh, supply anything today the exports are banned out of india but very soon they will be open and we should be ready by then to take advantage of this category of business which is completely non existent in india so this is the medical textile part but there is another part which is the protective collection as we, which has become the new essential for all brands in india if you i'm sure you guys are seeing all all brands are launching uh, masks which are uh, which are like uh, so uh, which are like uh, going with the shirt or uh, woven mask or it it has become a fashion shape statement of sorts here so i think this is another category which we should push for we should acquire more knowledge about and we should explore as an entrepreneur i i personally been saying that india is a big uh, we have a great resource of entrepreneurs so i think this is a category where we can really make an impact and create a business for ourselves in the times to come so this is the second part the third sustainability so sustainability is has been there for a long time we have worked everybody in its own capacity has been working on it but post covid consumer will place a much higher premium on mindful consumption and responsible business compliance to environment sustainability will be mandatory in ingredients to our business so a strong proposition on sustainability could be a competitive advantage and uh, we are in a position to take advantage of this area because we have abundance of recycled polyester yarn we have abundance of organic and bci cotton we have abundance of recycled cotton these days so if we can package it well for our customers we can give them a, a sustainable business environment i think this is a fantastic opportunity which is waiting to be captured by indian manufacturers so uh, having said that I, my focus was man made fibers sustainability and medical textiles now i pass it on to dev devi who devender who will talk about speed to market devi uh sorry i think i broke uh, my con but in between so uh roshan devi have already spoken about uh, the three opportunities on man made fiber Hello. on medical textiles and uh, sustainability over to you for speed to market yeah so so you know i am focusing more from the point of view of what i feel uh, can be uh, good for india as a country to focus on 
looking at what's happening in the world so one very very important aspect which is clearly emerging is speed to market that's been a mantra which a lot of people have been wanting to follow for a very long time but they have in my opinion being very lazy about it uh i think the now they have no choice because fashion is going to become more more and more on demand basis the uh, zara model will be you know the new essential uh i think people in fact if i look at uh, the trend which we are seeing from our customers 60% of the women's fashion is going to be on demand about 40% of the men's fashion would be on demand which means that you could have situations where the customers are looking from sketch to x factory starting from 30 days to 60 days uh and i think everybody will be forced to think like the way turkey thinks uh turkey is one of the most successful uh, you know countries when it comes to uh, manufacturing in spite of its high cost uh and i would say in fact almost 60% of the european trade at least happens through turkey uh it's it has a very very deep uh, uh you know uh, a, a connection with the uh, europe mainly because of its speed the kind of a product development it can do and i think that's a that's a thing which we have to bring it into india and it is very much possible because you know terip uh, clusters like teripur and surat actually are a very very good example of uh, speed to market if people really wanted to focus on these clusters you could be doing netwear in like 15 to 45 days delivery and so you could be doing even the man made fibers you know which uh, roshan was talking about you have very nice qualities and grade and processing houses available in surat tied up with the right manufacturing process we can really be very very fast and that's why you know there few things which has to happen uh for speed to market to work for in uh, for india deeper collaboration between the raw material suppliers process houses is a must and more importantly there has to be a very deep collaboration with the uh vendors customers as well as the agents or the customer own office because on ground uh approvals will be needed on ground trust factor would be needed anybody who is able to uh build trust with their customers because they the customer will love them they will give them even more business because now nobody can travel at least for 6 months you know and even if you're traveling you never know what is going to happen in terms of lockdown again or you may need to do quarantine many challenges are there in the world travel so the key is going to be who you can trust and that is going to lead to speed to market speed to market will come by deeper collaborations it will come again by the mind 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 shift which we have to make where we have to believe that we have to do right thing at the first time that's that would be the key yeah so they will like if i have to add uh, to your example of uh, turkey see the ecosystem that they have created is they are not only producing quickly but they are also producing on trend correct so the mills and the vendors are in collaboration always so that both of them are always very keen to know what is the next you know trend that is coming in so for customer when they walk in they see the on trend product so out here in india what we need to shift is from the getting the tech packs and the designs from the vend- uh, customer or like doing only the women stop kind of design so like yeah we can do continue to do the women stop designs but then we have to follow the trend and work very closely with the mill partner and the trim partner so that we can start showing that product to the customer so they can th- take a decision and we quickly deliver it that's that's a huge unlock that india can do because we have vertical across all uh, the chain supply chain yes 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 okay okay shami are you still there or uh, next, uh, i think we can go to the next yeah. one yeah yeah so so the other thing which i want to uh, talk about is uh, you know what i am calling dtc collection so just to uh you know make it easier dtc means direct to consumer and uh, we all know that e-commerce is going to be a big bigger and bigger share of every in fact uh, i think alibaba success in china actually happened after saas uh, episode happening in china and i think this covid is going to uh, completely change the way we look at product 
uh, and and how we shop for the product like we always know that uh, uh, there's been a lot of cases where people look at the product online and then they go to the shop you know to uh, actually see it physically and then immediately pick it up i think that will increase because people are not going to be looking at too much spending too much of a time when they are in the shop they want to be in and out uh, and uh, all the brands are looking at strategies as to how to become make their e-commerce business more relevant how to make it more juicy how to you know attract the customers more and more towards their e-commerce business and one of the things which will which will need to be done is that brands will need to create some special modules some special uh, collections which are geared up only for dtc you know which are uh, which will give them a lot of width and they are it's also giving them some kind of a communication tool on an ongoing basis whether it's on instagram facebook blogging so they're able to come out with a lot of new things you know they're able to use them as a communication tool also more importantly what we have seen is that these dtc styles are the one on which they are going to be testing on reacting on repeating on so you will not only have a advantage of uh, you know uh, getting uh, bigger chain orders but you will also have a advantage of more uh, repeats coming in on the same thing and because they are uh, repeats uh, uh, and the flexibility is needed the customer is very happy to have versions of the same thing coming in and uh, uh, that's where I, again i feel that india is in a very unique position because as a country we are able to handle lower moqs we are able to handle you know a lot of uh, uh, runs in terms of the number of styles and uh, the only thing which is in my opinion missing in india is a manufacturing thought process of a modular system that we will need to create if we want to have a uh, you know some kind of a good presence on for the dtc uh, because customer would like to say okay i want to buy 50 styles from you every month and then uh, i will also be buying maybe uh, you know 15 styles which are going to be repeat out of that 50 and then maybe the another five styles out of that would be big styles so actually anybody who is going to embrace the dtc collection and focusing on that in my opinion will automatically win a lot of bigger orders and uh, because you are there and the, and the customer don't have any more time to cook the recipe again whoever has the recipe takes the cake yeah the other thing which i uh, want to talk about and it is really close to the heart here and we are really trying to see how we can mobilize a lot of our brands we work with uh, some of the ngo partners we work with other people we work with is something you know it's it's just uh, something which is cooking right now uh, what we trying to call it like a hope collection and the idea here is that you bring in all the stakeholders of our industry to come together for this collection we would like brands to be part of it we would like uh, you know all the um, uh, raw material suppliers the to be part of it the manufacturers to be part of it buying agencies you know anybody who is involved in this uh, uh, business is actually trying to come together and say okay we have to create some kind of a branding which is like a hope collection and this hope collection is in a way assuring that uh, everybody is contributing towards the challenges which we are facing on the covid side and we are uh, bringing uh, you know stories where we are all proud of and we're bringing a collection where there's a lot of contribution also happening socially as well as uh, you know from the uh, medical perspective and as a medical perspective in terms some kind of a share going from the sales to help people who are uh, you know suffering or who've been you know uh, have been financially hit by the uh, covid situation and uh, i think it's a uh, again i think india can play a very very uh, unique role here why it can play a very very unique role is because we are amazing design design sensibilities there we have very very good raw materials we have very very good storytelling skills uh, uh, we have emotional question uh, availability now the thing is that how do we all how do we put it all together 
how do we actually do the right pr how do we actually get the government also uh, you know come together on it some ngos taking the you know the 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 banner for it and saying oh we will make it happen we we are going to get some good retailers on board for it you know so i think if we all collectively work towards this uh, concept uh, and we make it a concept which is coming from india you know which has its origin from india will be a very very big advantage for uh, you know for india where very clearly uh, india on paper is the best country to take advantage of what is going to happen with china but in reality we are very poor to take that advantage so we have to we, we have to really really uh, dig deep and think where we have these low hanging fruits you know where we actually play our to our play to our strengths uh, in first stage where we are securing business and in the second uh, 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 situation we are increasing our business around that so it's like a you know like we were having this discussion that okay maybe these these things are all about niche but in my opinion they are a niche where you can own the market share so once you own the market share the niche is huge i mean in terms of the, uh, the the base of the business which is getting created yeah i agree with you devender and uh, i think uh, this is the time if we don't do things rightly again we we'll lose opportunities where we are thinking that chinese orders could come to us but finally we see that vietnam bangladesh thailand or even even myanmar picking up the pie which india should have got so uh, i think uh, in terms of manufacturing excellence in terms of opportunities which are available i think we should grab them right now this is the time when world is looking up uh, looking for india to support uh, this will be a great uh, great advantage we can take out of this uh, covid pandemic thank you roshan thank you devi that uh, that was a whole slew of uh, opportunities that uh, we can tap into and again it's all there with a little effort and creativity um i think we it, we could definitely be be on the global stage uh, uh, uh you brought up an interesting point about uh, business from china um and uh, we have questions um that are that are flowing in from um you know from our listeners here so um i want to go straight into the the question session take a few questions and have them answered and then use our last 5 minutes to uh, bring the session to to a constructive uh, wrap so uh, try to keep your answers to the point um and so that we can have uh, all the uh, at least all the questions that have come up and we've chosen a chance to be answered and and then we'll go to a complete uh, you know a, a wrap and the final slide so uh, maybe i'll throw this out to dr beda there's a question here dr beda about um how do we acquire export clients who were previously purchasing from china and are now looking for indian suppliers considering prices may be hiked all around us and higher cost so how do we go about navigating that so this question is too wide and when you talk about china is a huge industry they do all kinds of products but let me just give a generic answer which can work for everything before you get any customer into your uh, your your business is know your customer's customer so once you know what the pain points of your customer are you are able to come out with a customized solution that this is what i can offer you and in india it can be a strength can be design it can be speed to market what devender talked about and it can be quality of service so if three things we can play on and third thing is we have to demonstrate our capability through our past record so as long as we are able to show that yes we are a trustworthy partner who can offer you a great service and we know what your pain points are and we have a solution for you i think getting a customer to you is not a problem so that's what my simple approach to any company approaching a new customer would be from china or for that matter any other place thank you thank you uh, dr beda um i have a question for uh, palab with his uh, vast uh, experience um you know of traversing the entire uh, supply chain so there's a question here how can indian apparel manufacturing lead in the global stage that's a very uh, important question definitely uh, how it can lead of course like we have to do a lot of catch up at this point of time 
and uh, i think we have the potential to lead india if it becomes much more manufacturing oriented uh, definitely nobody can stop us and today in fact a lot of the western countries and developed countries are looking at india to really flex our manufacturing muscles uh, uh, as we said like you know it, it, actually a manufacturing hub needs a good strong ecosystem if you are just putting one factory and importing everything to make a garment it's difficult so as the whole thing like if you look at even smaller sections like in uh, in north uh, in delhi or in south in tirupur a uh, ecosystem has been built where a lot of factories are in close uh, proximity because everything else is available to do it fast so similarly like you know we have to uh, do some deep thinking in terms of how we can scale up how we can go even bigger but some of the points that we discussed today like how we should present ourselves to the customers think uh, on behalf of our customers look into those opportunities specifically which we have not explored uh, as yet so those are the things that we have to be open for and uh, in terms of our costings we have to be very very innovative uh, you saw right notion like you know before covid Uh, we had worked in and we thought okay we were sweating it out but as covid hit us people are thinking and and that thought process you're coming out with very innovative ways to bring down your cost so that will also make india much more competitive uh, in nutshell i think these are the few points that i can think of uh, of the hat thank you thank you palav that was uh, that, yeah that was on the spot and uh, i think your uh, your answer hit uh, you know certain points on the head um i have a question um that's come up about the future of manufacturing especially with the current scenario and i think roshan was handling manufacturing on a day to day basis with his innovative hat on the question goes like this roshan will the manufacturing companies encourage work from home after the end of this pandemic <laughs> so that's a good one but i i'm sure you can come up with a a positive scenario for that tammy uh, we are a manufacturing uh, com- a uh, country and company manufacturing uh, unlike it very difficult to be handled from home but uh, having said that there are a few functions which can be handled from home uh, especially the design part the product development in terms of e fits those can to a large extent be handled from home but uh, essentially difficult very difficult to uh, to work from home in our kind of industry unless we are just trading we we, we are a manufacturing people we have to keep a tap on our ex, uh, production on our uh, on our uh, samples on our on all the other aspects of manufacturing we it's very difficult right now i think uh, the sooner we get back to work the better it is for the industry uh, we i i personally do not see uh work from home as a viable option as of now for the manufacturing industry absolutely uh, I, i mean i think creativity and innovation goes a long way but at certain points uh, realism and you know being realistic about this we touched upon it but there's a question and it'll be nice to reiterate because technology is going to play such a huge role what are the three technology advancement apparel industry will be looking at uh to sustain in this new normal so shami i would again say that you know uh, again come back to the attitude because uh, technology is as good as who is using it mm-hmm. it doesn't matter you know you have the best machinery or the best systems being instituted by a best consultant in the world but ultimately it all boils down to you know the attitude of the organization which is going and using it and that's and from having said that i think there are enough low hanging fruits for everyone and everybody has been talking about you know everybody today is making uh, patterns on 2d digitally uh, why not maybe we're losing your video we're losing you there a bit maybe you can cut the video yeah um in many iterations in terms of the design itself you know one design could be converted into 50 designs you yeah. know you think using uh, uh, the 3d tools which we have, which we have uh, just by changing the way the machinery is being set up you know modular system the way you training it and and i think people forget one thing that india has always been on peace rate basis you know for a very very long time 
which clearly means that it is a country which has a skill level and if you can combine the modular manufacturing with the skill level you will have amazing productivity and amazing flexibility which is going to be the key pillar in time to come thank you so i would say that you know this is what i would like to summarize it in terms of the it's not about advancement the advancement is already there it is about how we use it yeah thank you so much and i'm going to take one last question um is what which is very uh, top on many people's minds and in fact the entire uh, globe's mind what steps can we take to become a leader in uh, sustainable fashion and um, i'm going to take this as a segue into uh, wrapping it up i think it's a very important point close to all our hearts um i think for us to lead in sustainability i wouldn't even call sustainable fashion for us to lead in sustainability as a country it's very very important that leadership in every organization understands what it truly means to them because sustainability to one person is different sustainability to another now it's very easy for you to make sustainable clothing which means you're just transforming what your client or your buyer asks you to do it doesn't reflect on your sustainable point of view so the first step i my advice would be be very clear as to what is it that you want to do uh when it comes to sustainability and it has to align with your core business and it also has to align with probably a umbrella guide which is the un sustainable development goal is it around water is it around poverty is it around positive uh effect to our uh, employers once you have that you know then everything that you do and breathe will become sustainable and your client and your buyers will understand it's not just translating their their uh need but as a collaboration you're sustainable they are sustainable and together you know we become a much a much more sustainable nation right so that to me is is one one way you could go about being a leader in sustainability is understand what is it where do you want to make the maximum impact right so with that i want to wrap up our three sessions and uh, you know touch upon which you know which may be smaller and leaner businesses manufacturers and retailers need to react accordingly to these shifts improving productivity in various ways was touched upon added focus on reducing lead time and quality 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 so that was the key point that came up from the money and resources now talking about human resources we have to be aware of the paradigm shift that's happening 9010 becomes the new 8020 we got to be strategic versus being opportunistic that's very important we got to focus on our sharp point what are we about where do we want to leverage where do we want to maximize and maximize our impact and then management has to lead from the front and all methods may not work anymore investment in training will really pay off digital sampling is a must for reducing lead time cost and winning orders and now is is the time to act so these were the things that you would be working with your teams if you want to pick up, up you know two or three of this and say this is what we are going to focus on and lastly the opportunities uh roshan and devi spoke about man made fibers the onset of medical textiles and the huge demand and what the role india plays today the role of sustainability in the products we make design and sell the speed to market speed to consumer speed to you know our end uh, retail destination how are we going to how are we going to increase that or rather decrease that direct to consumer it's it's happening more and more around the world and this is the time for india to grasp that opportunity protective fashion essentials and then uh the very conceptual beautiful hope collection that devi so uh emotionally spoke about i think is something that we do need for the industry to come together and what visa is all about a unified approach to take this industry to a different level so i think with that we are at the end of our um session thank you so much for joining us from different parts of the world thank you for being such ardent listeners with lots of questions we will try to address a lot of them as as we can and um so just just to vista is an integrated value creating voice and platform for fiber to fashion concept to consumer value chain by seasoned professionals there's our 
email address there, please write to us. It's also at the bottom of our poster that you saw. And stay tuned for our next webinar in May. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.